Let's make the future. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon. Thanks. Well, good morning, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we should do everything. Just one more suggestion is this measurable metrics for a better society. So what are metrics that maybe a government or like whatever instance should introduce to measure progress of the country? I would propose that we simply take a vote of uh, ideas on the table right now. I vote for any idea. Let's start. You guys are down. Yeah. Measurements right. of a good society. Yeah, I, I vote for that all all too. Too. Okay. okay, you're good. Great. Okay. Then. How about oh, Michael? Let's, hello? What's your vote? You think I'm fine with the you guys choose, right? Okay. okay. Okay, great. Let's talk about it. Welcome to Let's Make the Future, a discussion about future trends, technologies, and their implications for human society. We are coming to you from all over the world. Let's introduce ourselves. I'm Michael Curry. I was raised in Canada, and I enjoy computer programming, planning new businesses, and discussing historical events and future trends. Hello, everyone. I'm Tanyan, and I'm an entrepreneur and interested in philosophy, privacy, decentralized organization, and I'm happy to talk with you. Hi, I'm Daniel Valenzuela, a mathematician and social impact enthusiast. Currently based in Munich. My name is Michael Olorunimo. I'm from Nigeria. I'm currently based in the Bay Area in the California. I'm interested in social entrepreneurship, uh, blockchain, and how to scale innovation and technology to the bottom 2 billion people in the world. My name is Hossein Kohani, a tech group Finoir from Iran. Currently living in Michigan, interested in biomedical technologies, cryptocurrencies, and cosmology. Thank you, everybody, for coming to Let's Make the Future this week. We've just had a powwow. We've decided to talk about measurable metrics for a better society. So I think the topic came up once we were talking about different cultural ideals and what we would think would maybe be ideal, to be an ideal, to actually have a positive impact on the whole society. But we have a very significant metric, the GDP, that is always being center of attention for many countries and societies in order to improve, track and improve that, and hence also influences a lot decisions in politics and economy. So now the question is, how could we maybe adapt this metric to be more positive on the overall society and overall world, maybe? Because the GDP has obviously some flaws, like increasing the GDP will not benefit the society of the GDP, which got increased. So instead of a GDP, imagine a happiness index as it is in Bhutan. Do you think that will be something that would be a good idea to put attention on? So you're asking if the GDP is a good metric? Or if it could be improved upon? I think there has been a lot of conversation around GDP not being a very great measure because it is, you can basically have a certain percent, a small percentage of the population of a country producing the most of the GDP, you know, and then you probably, because you can have a largely unproductive population and still have a very large GDP. So which means that it's huge. All right. And then you have a GDP per capita, which is just an average of GDP divided by total population. So it does, while that is great, but it doesn't really show the living standard of the people. It doesn't really demolish, it doesn't really portray that living standard. GDP not being a very great measure of production of the, of the population or in terms of their living standard. So what other metric, you know, should we be looking at? So given the fact that we're going to a fourth industrial revolution right now, and the there is a need for uh, economy to be more inclusive. You know, to how do we carry out? We how do we ensure inclusiveness and carry everybody along? So, what kind of measures should we be pursuing? You know, should we, should we define? You know, for the future that we want. So, the, the metric that we define right now will help us. Should help us to get to the future that we want to get to. Pretty much. I agree with you, Michael. We want to have a metric that focuses more closely on what we actually want, which is people to be happy, like Bhutan's idea of having a gross happiness index. But it seems to me like the problem is human nature. What we want is to be better than our neighbors, more than we want to be actually in absolute terms better off. And this has been shown in study after study. If you survey different countries, their absolute level of happiness doesn't really change even if they have widely varying GDP levels, for example. Or I guess this is saying, oh, well, maybe then we should try to change our measure from GDP. But it seems like any other metric that you could think of, it 
doesn't really work because it's all relative. So if I have uh, $1,000, but my neighbors all have $900, then I'm going to be happier than if I have $2,000 and all my neighbors have $5,000. It's sad, but it seems to be true. So how do we define the best society? And then define metrics and that. Before we go into that, one of the questions I can ask is, what is the future metrics that we can define? And to answer that, we can come up with new ideas. It might also reflect the question, what's a good society? Because I guess if we are trying to define a good society, it's open-ended question, and it's hard to actually define something. My idea, actually, is designing a system or kind of capturing a data concern that each society has in a meta level and trying to analyze those and figuring out what is the top concerns that people are facing with in different societies and then trying to compare and compression that. But what I mean that not just like generalizing every value into GDP, which means like money in a sense, like how we can actually create some sort of important metrics that can be defined or measured in a sense. I guess the problem with happiness is hard to measure happiness in a sense. So, and the question of whether we need to have quantifiable metrics or non-quantified mat- metrics and what is the other option for quantifiable metrics except gdp or money would be whether would be what would be the other essential that identify that the economist has a livability index where they rank cities on their livability like do they have parks do they have nice roads so that you don't spend too much time commuting are there nice shops for people to shop at what is the city's overall cleanliness appearance that sort of thing it seems to me like people's happiness is more at the city level than at the country level the pleasantness of New York is very different than the pleasantness of Cheyenne, Wyoming. It's very different, even though the United States, it's all the same country there, right? They're both cities are in the same country. Maybe if we focus on metrics to do with individual cities, we can get at what makes people happy, or we can have better metrics, like how many roads you have, amount of living space you have, commute time. Maybe these are the right metrics to be focusing on. Every country, they're not completely the same. So I think every country has different characteristics. There are countries that are more collective, like Middle Eastern countries. There are countries that are more individualistic, like Western countries. And I don't think the metrics can be the same as long as it's indirect metrics, like the ones discussed so far. The economical, societal, and physical metrics that discussed so far, they are different in different countries. But I guess if we get into the internal aspects of happiness, which is the biology or psychology, that would be a more generalized approach that can be applied to all human beings. And if you ask me, even animals. So there are cats that are happier in the US and their cats are miserable in other countries. So believe me, they're not the same. So uh, I guess some implants in the future would be the answer to measure hormonal balances of people. And of course, they won't be just for that. Let's say, you know, right now, Google gives gives you a service like a Gmail and Google Drive, but at the same time collects a lot of information from the users that they don't even think about it. So in the future, biological implants, let's say there's a glucose sensor that is implanted to your body and it has a lot of sensors that can measure your hormones, the cortisol, and when your stress is high, you can't be happy. If you ask me when I'm stressed, are you happy? I'm not going to say I'm happy because I have a job. I'm not going to say I'm happy because I have food to put in my mouth and I'm not going to say I'm happy because I have shelter. I'm just going to say I'm miserable because I have an exam tomorrow. So it's the stress level. It's the daily interactions of people that I think would be the most accurate data for happiness. Unless you go on a social level, which is different. You want to be general. You want to be simple. You go for factors like GDP and so on and so forth. But unless you don't get to this level, I don't buy any of the outcome of data collections of happiness. So if the metric is hormone levels, then couldn't governments just distribute free heroin to everybody and then they would maximize that metric? Yeah, I mean, you can, I can go 
would argue that, but maybe not heroin, but other drugs because heroin, it's super addictive. And the problem with addiction is that resources are tight and people can't afford it. If you can give heroin to everybody forever, they're going to be the happiest Wait. people on earth till they die. But they so you're gonna... cycle, you know, that's another problem. Wait, so you're going to double down on that? That was a reductio... Go ahead, Daniel. I just want to say to make it sustainable, like a sustainable happiness index, it needs to be constructive in terms of like also benefiting the economy at some point. Then I feel like there will be a problem with heroin. Michael, I'm sorry, Daniel, but to be precise here, I want to say human biology is not just one form. Heroin is just one way to make you happy. If when you're in a group and your status is a good in a situation, then you also feel happy because your hormones are changed. If you get a yeah. new job, if you get rewarded, there are multiple, multiple ways that your biology can respond to the environment. Drugs are the most <laughs> direct. It is a choice a lot of people are even making right now, right today, but a lot of people don't make that choice. Think about it. But Haas, just to clarify, is your measurement system, is it distinguishing between the kind of happiness that you get from a drug and the kind of happiness that you get from doing well at your job? Or are you saying that people have the personal choice to achieve happiness in whatever way they want and you don't see a distinction in the preference of whether... Here's the correction factor I can think of. But when I give you data, I'm saying person X is 59% happy, person Y is 63% happy using these measurements. I am going to also tell you the information that what kind of life is that they're living. Let's say there is an astronaut who is 59%. And I'm going to tell you there's a homeless person who is 32% happy and there's a homeless person who is 98% happy because he just got heroin. But the other one didn't get his dose. So the information of happiness cannot go alone. You have to tell the in settings. What are the settings of the target that you're talking about? Yeah, he's happy. Well, what kind of happy? Is he happy because he has a good family, because his children makes him happy, or he's happy because he has drugs? I guess we always need that information. How do we define happiness? Because you have to do a concept of it. And if you look at the psychological definition of happiness, and it says uh, a state of well-being that encompasses living a good life. So I think that generally speaking, if you have some things present in your life, you have a baseline level of happiness. We're not saying that people need to be 100% happy. But the point right now is, I think the thing we do right now is, is we define is what level of happiness should you not go below? Because, I mean, you don't have to be 80% happy all the time, but if you are 20% happy, you know, it means that you are definitely not very happy. You know, there is something not present in your life that is making you unhappy. So it really defines a baseline of what level of happiness people need to have. You know, and then the question right now is what are the things, you know, what are the causes, you know, what are the things present, you know, that will give you that level of happiness. I think it all boils down to if you stay a good life, then you're referring to maybe people standard of living, you know, are they able to pursue their dreams? Do they have a house on their head? Do they have some basic income? Are they able to afford some things? Do you have a family? You know, are you in love or are you not in love? Do you have a job to do? You know, it's just some certain basic things that make you reasonably happy not necessarily very happy in my opinion i think there's many problems going on with the measurement and i think that also what you said michael also plays in the same direction that how do you measure like there's short-term happiness there's long-term happiness and it's hard to find a way to say how the overall happiness about a longer period of time is. And it's a good question if one should try to just have a bound and not let people fall below that or try to maximize happiness. But I want to... <laughs> What, what was that laugh, <laughs> Michael? Maybe yeah, no, uh, it wasn't me, but maybe someone was falling their bound there when you said that. I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, okay. Go uh, ahead, Daniel. Okay, sorry. There's this happyplanetindex.org website where they have their method of measuring happiness. And the top three countries with the highest scores are Costa Rica, Mexico, and Colombia. So all countries that are probably not the most stable, not the most democratic, and also not the most safe ones. So there's again, and that's maybe something Haas needs to explain us with his proposed method of measurement. So what the difference of perceived happiness and measured, like biologically measured happiness is, and also how that plays into short-term versus long-term happiness and how you can explain these results. Like I don't think people in U.S., they are happy in general and then their senses because they are thinking about the problems that they want to solve and then they're just like working towards that so they don't really think as happiness as a virtue of life in a sense 
why another country in Egypt probably have. And my suggestion here is like, since we're talking about like future organization and future of everything, uh, essentially, like I'm interested to know what type of um, society will look like and then what would be the different or futuristic methods of measurement would also look like and how we can and whether the fund the more fundamental question and for example if we provide like ai and robots and those people also involve our, our society whether there are interests also involved in how we perceive the society um or not and is it like based on western or like eastern society and which one is actually much to, which values is much better to measure so it's kind of like a broader question of how we can structure future measurement for the future society this might be a good idea to focus more on the bigger picture because right now we're only focusing on happiness what is the metric we would suggest to measure should everybody be like a very successful entrepreneur entrepreneur or should everybody just be happy as in i don't know colombia but maybe we like the world's progress will be slower i think this issue is very pressing because we're facing a jobless future where automation makes it possible for all of the goods and services that currently comprise our gdp to be to be completely automated to be produced by robots in such a world it makes no sense to equate prosperity with the amount of goods and services that can be produced because humans are no longer involved in the production of those goods and services. So, of course, if we as humans enjoy those goods and services, then that should factor into the equation somehow. But I think it's important that we start caring about other measures, given how GDP is going to be much less connected to how people live their day-to-day -day lives. Sure, we'll be consuming products, and so the metric should have something to do with our consumption of the products, but it should be something different that accounts for the fact that we're no longer earning our living by producing these products and instead we're essentially at the mercy of the small number of people that will own all of the commanding heights or in fact the artificial intelligences that will control the commanding heights well i have a couple of questions before you get to that point one is how long would you take that it's going to be massive destruction And until that point, you have a huge gap in the society. I'm part of the society that are uh, completely enter the new world and they see automation and then the other problem they are still facing with lots of like uh, other types of problems and it's hard to see automation in that kind of new part of the world and it's going to be a huge gap which what i see i tweeted this today that robots will sponsor larger purses at sporting events in the future to help keep humans busy and to stave off a human rebellion after technological unemployment so i wonder if robots will devise complicated games for us to play that will be sort of like the Facebook algorithms are today in very insidiously designed to keep us addicted and keep us like vaguely happy and as a result we will continue to you know live in the society and behave well even though there's nothing for us to really do anymore because the robots are doing everything for us so you're saying we are in some future scenario will become pets of robots that's interesting essentially and then basically the metric or the measurable metric for our happiness will be some complicated algorithm the robots have designed which is like probability of a rebellion plus the probability of something else. Some algorithm designed to minimize the chance that we're going to cause a big hassle for them. I'm gonna comment something here that addresses all the points uh, specifically in what Michael, you said, is that you said in a jobless future, we can't create value. You didn't say that, but I guess I want to say, you said we can't create our needs, so we are not gonna be happy maybe, but I think we will in a way, because I'm gonna give you an example. You know, all of us hate when somebody sends a template mail email to us right then something gets automatic even if it's efficient even if it's what we need we don't like it why because I think any goods and services that are produced by robots it loses value after a while even though they create sustainability even if they sustainably create your food your shelter all the repeatable algo 
algorithm it work is gonna be replaced by machines that's right but does it mean we're gonna be unhappy not doing those things no honestly let me tell you something the reason that humans like the jobs that are algorithmic the only reason is that they can share that with other human beings and they can feel useful so in a society that all the algorithmic work is gonna be replaced with machines which we will never get there because I think we always update any kind of activity will get to a point that it becomes algorithmic so it's an endless I guess journey first of all so I don't think it's a point that there's no other algorithmic work and everything else is just creative because anything you do even if it's not do we just lose the person speaking? Uh oh, the machines got him. Yeah, I guess. I feel like uh, I, I feel like what he was. I feel like what he was about to say sounded very interesting, and I'm not sure where it was heading, but it was a great introduction for what he would have said. But I don't know what it is now. Well, I hope he joins in a moment to finish his thought. Somebody else has a thought they want to. Yeah, it's a, just a double on the last point being made. I think we will never get to a point where humans would have no work to do. Maybe, I think we'll always be, human beings would like to change things. We will probably continue to update things that have been done that become stale and then we'll keep building new things. But like the future that would be, I'm just trying to like imagine a future where machines do everything. So it just means that only a few people who actually have the resources to own machines, to own those kind of advanced machines would control the future. So that's what, so economically, I think that we're probably headed for a very, very, a future of pure with a few very you know powerful people and who are just going to be everybody else by default in the very lower social structure in terms of economic power and access to different things so that's really what i'm imagining right now and i wonder how that will impact on the level of happiness in general i agree michael that there will be extreme inequality in the future just projecting on current trends there will be a small number of individuals that control a large amount of the capital that's producing our GDP. And yet, I disagree with you that most people will be in poverty because, or will be unable to own machines because in the future, keep in mind, everything will be cheaper too because that's just the economics of the singularity. And so a very, very small amount of money will go a very long way in the future. And so I think as long as we're not talking about trying to make everyone's relative prosperity higher, which, of course, as we know, is mathematically impossible. And if we're just focused on making people's absolute happiness high, then I think it's totally possible. I will also add one other thing that we all think about automation and kind of like a future society with the current human being that we are today. But we forget about talking about how we're going to change in that society because we think that we're going to remain in a physical format, in the mental capability format in the same way that we are today. And we're thinking about the future, but we consider ourselves with the today, whoever we are. And I think our intelligence, for example, it would increase in many different ways. We might increase different sensor to understand the world better. We might be able to have many different types of simulations. We might combine with robots. We, we might. There's millions of possibilities that might exist that gives us not a hopeless future, but the future that we combine with many different types of reality that we live in today. That's my perception. But I'd like to hear Haas if he's here to finish up his talk too. Yes, please. I'm back. Sorry. I was disconnected. I don't know how much of it took what I was saying, but I'm down right now. Haas, you were talking about the reason humans like algorithmic jobs. Yeah, more or less. I was saying that people do jobs not because they're algorithmic or they're creative. They do that because it creates value for other human beings. And there's always a chase of algorithm, of automation, of value. So let's say today I create a new electronic device. Today, Haas makes a new electronic device. Everyone loves it. And because of that, there's just a scarcity of it. It gets $1 billion each Okay. But after a while, other people on other sides of the planet, they see, oh, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of demand here. So they try to compete and they try to make that device themselves to compete and also create that value that people want. And then down the path, what happens is that they're going to make it more efficient. So they automate the process and everything. And then after a while, the value of the product drops essentially to zero because the supply gets too much, then everybody has it 
and no one likes it anymore. It's like a lot of products that we take for granted today and they don't make us happy anymore. Nobody really enjoys just having a cell phone anymore because everyone has it. What makes people happy is a new application, for example, that their friends didn't use it before or it's a novel idea. I also think it's more like a journey. So the phones are just changing. Also, for example, maybe food is a good example. People change their diets, change their identify with the choices they have with food. And also with smartphones, I feel like they're becoming different to like serve different needs. And it's always under constant development. And also, I still think that there's a lot of people that are still stoked about getting a smartphone. I think that's just something that first needs to distribute. Or there's like always this like early adopters thing where smartphones then out over a larger market and yeah i'm not really sure if it ends like this and drops to zero i feel like this dropping to zero it's not really happening it's just like a continuous transformation i think Haas, what you're getting at is the inequality that i was alluding to at the beginning and in fact that we discussed in the first episode of let's make the future asshole technologies where some technologies are status goods and when you buy them your happiness from buying it comes from the fact that other people don't have it. And so when everyone has it, you are less happy for having it. It's like buying a Rolex watch. If every other human being owned a Rolex watch, people wouldn't be very happy with their Rolex watch. The whole point of it is to distinguish yourself from other people. And I remember in our episode about asshole technologies, I think we all sort of realized that it's impossible to base a society around getting everyone to have asshole technologies because by their very nature, you can't have everyone <laughs> be happy from having Having them. People have to derive their happiness from more fundamental things. And we almost, like, I think I come so far as to make a moral judgment on those kinds of goods and to say, that's not the kind of good we want to be promoting in society. It's a very bad good. Societies that are focused on the acquisition of goods that are all about permuting your status in society it's inherently impossible to make everyone prosperous or happy in that society because it's not like everyone can have that prosperity good. It's better to have a society where everyone can enjoy happiness in some way, like a society where everyone values spending time in the countryside or watching television or movies, things that aren't about distinguishing yourself as being better than other people. Can we wrap this somehow back to the thought of a like metric not global, but like societal metric. Yeah, I have a proposal. I guess we can come up with business idea page competition. Okay. Is Daniel, do you have time for that or do you need to go? And Let's do it. Let's keep it crisp and concise. Okay. So no comments on these business ideas. How about that? Go ahead, Michael. What were you going to say? Yeah, I think it'd be a metric. It's a metric and a business idea. You know, just to keep it on point. Yeah, maybe the business competition is a metric. So each of us proposes one metric. How about that? I like that. Okay. So everyone, let's take 30 seconds to think of a metric because I haven't thought of one in my head yet unless someone is ready to go already it's time for the elevator pitch battle let's begin anyone who wants to start okay i'm ready me too i guess we can start with you guys okay i'll start round one michael curry so my measurable metric for a better society is minimum income and it's not what you think it's Let's say there's a country of 30 million people. You find the person in society with the lowest income, and that's the metric. So we try to improve that number. Cool. Okay. What's next? I think I can go next. Round two. Michael Allerunenwo. So my business idea and metric would be to look how much money do you need to make to make a reasonable level of life, to actually have a minimum life. If you are in a job that pays you less than that, you know, the government is going to subsidize you. There's going to be like a subsidy, you know, to say, okay, but every, you must be on a job. Everybody must be on a job to qualify for that. And we're going to design a blockchain platform whereby we're able to tell, you know, what kind of job each person is doing and then why they're not any more money, but that will be paid over the blockchain. Cool. Nice. Blockchain. Love it. So, who will go next? Round three. Daniel Valenzuela. So, I'll just go next. I feel like all our metrics will result in a really great metric if we just take the product out of them or something. Because some are local, like person-wise, as Michael's, and some are like contextual or global on a societal level, like Michael O's. 
I think that's cool. So mine would be another factor, which would be ecological footprint. I think that that's something a country needs to care about, but not only in order to like improve their own society, but improve overall world society in terms of that it's like an intra-societal improvement metric. So you influence other societies with it as well and motivate whole supply chains to improve. Cool, cool. Round four. Parnion Barricatane. My idea is not to have one centric matrix, but have structured a decentralized matrix based on different communities and measure ecosystem for kind of parallel matrix in different networks in types of organizations and groups that people involve and kind of have high level of hierarchy also. And metrics, in a sense, depends on how we relate in different groups, society, and the world in general. Round five, Hossein Kuhani. All right, the matrix I would suggest is a collection of hormonal sensors implanted into the body, monitoring human hormones and neurochemistry 24-7. That's the ultimate sensor for happiness I come up with. And of course, if you go with the macro level data as well, you can't cheat with drugs though, if you want to come up with the happiness metric in that sense. If if you're on drugs, you're out of data. You're not being eligible to be measured. (laughs) You're on drugs. All right. So should we take a vote here? I'm going to read off the different metrics, okay? So Michael C, minimum income of the poorest person. Michael O, how much money you need to make to have a reasonable life. Daniel, ecological footprint. Parnian, decentralized metrics based on different communities. Haas, a collection of hormonal sensors monitoring human neurochemistry. Okay, so you all know the drill on three, two... Wait, hold on. Everyone needs to think of a person. I haven't thought of somebody yet. (laughs) Okay, I'm ready. Three, two, one, Daniel. Michael. Haas. Osman. Okay, I think Haas, you got two votes there, right? I believe that makes Haas the winner. Congratulations. Nice. I just quickly want to... Thank you. Congratulations to Haas. And I quickly want to clarify that with Michael, I meant like the product of the both metrics of the both Michaels. Or like probably more the quotient. The quotient, right. I need to run, unfortunately, guys. It was really fun having you. I wish... All of you a great day or a good night. And yeah, we'll see us next week. I had a great time too. Thanks, Daniel. It was cool. Very spontaneous. Nice. I like it. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye. It was great having you guys. Yeah. Bye. Well, thank you, Michael, again with your efforts on editing and connecting to Christian. Great. Parney, you got a goodbye also? Or maybe she dropped out. Yes, she had. It was so good. It like blew her out like out of the <laughs> Okay. We'll splice her goodbye in from last week. It was great. Have a great time, everyone. All right, this was actually really good. And thank you so much, Daniel, for the topic idea. I think you did a great job thinking of this topic. So thank you very much. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye everybody. <laughs> Let's make the future. Featuring the voices of Michael Olarunenwo. Parnion Barakatane, Daniel Valenzuela, Hossein Kuhani, Michael Curry. Music and editing, Christian Peltonen. 